We've got a new victim here, the DX40. Uh, we will see what shape this baby is in. So we'll go through the thing top to bottom and uh, make sure that the transmitter is up to snuff. There's a few surprises, as there usually is in some of these unknown transmitters. I've seen a lot of service. There's been some modifications done that always seem to surprise people when they open it up and see something that's not in the manual. So one thing I wanted to cover before we started was uh, kind of a complacency that's set in with uh, high voltage circuits. Uh, in the manual they talk about almost anything on this transmitter as being lethal voltage. Well, I can tell you that uh, you do not want to get across six, seven hundred volts uh, of DC and uh, it can really be dangerous. And uh, the worst shock I ever had was 117 AC. I came across a ground at 117 AC going right through me. Uh, high voltage, if you can escape it, it's, uh, it's very, very painful, but as long as you can get off the high voltage, you can, uh, you can escape it usually, and, it, and you just recoil. Of course, that can cause other problems where you can hurt yourself in other ways. There was a guy in the ham club when I was a kid who mentioned that his Apache, his Heathkit Apache, almost killed him. And I said, well, how did that happen? He says, well, I got my finger underneath the circuit, and I could not let go. This is something that uh, high voltage can do. Your muscles contract and you can't let go. He says, finally, I fell to the floor and released from the high voltage and that saved me. He says, but my trauma was not over. The Apache followed me to the floor, fell on me, and actually caused more damage than the shock. I can see right off the bat that somebody has replaced the... AC cord, that's usually a good sign. Got some markings on the back, VFO. So this guy has been used. So somebody decided to use flathead uh, metal screws in this thing, but it's okay. Keeps the case on. Okay. Wow, we got markings. Okay, not too bad. Looks like everything's there. As with every rig I try to bring back to life, the first thing you want to do is remove all of the tubes and uh, test them with your tester. And uh, then we're going to uh, flip it over, see, see what it looks like, and then uh, clean it up. Um, this does not look too bad, and it certainly looks like it, it's been used over the years, and uh, it's had some attention paid to it. So here's one sign that uh, this has actually been uh, been worked with over the years. Uh, we have a 6146B in here, rather than the original 6146. So um, this guy has been in use probably through the, uh, maybe even up through the 80s. So for safety, I like to just close the... Uh, Close the capacitor. Oh, bless my stars! Look at this. It has already been recapped. It has uh, not been solid stated. It's still using the tube, but we have some fairly new electrolytics in here. So, and this looks like a new capacitor. That looks like a new capacitor. This guy has been gone through already. I might need to do zero. Ooh, look at this clever thing. Somebody has put a piece of paper in here to break the uh, the key jack. There's got to be a story behind that. Wow, who was this guy? He even put a tie wrap on the other side of the cord like I usually do. So, uh, this guy's just going to need a cleanup, and we'll see what we got here. So, after the cleanup, it actually looks pretty good. Um, I did not give it a bath per se, I just did a little uh, surface work, got rid of all the, uh, the homemade writing that was on it, and uh, shined it up a little bit. Uh, tightened uh, some of the hardware on the surface. I found one cold solder joint in the uh, RF tank and took care of that. I also uh, checked any uh, fasteners around the meter to make sure that was good. Uh, hit some uh, the contacts of the uh, tube sockets with contact cleaner. Changed out the knobs so it was a little more period. 
and uh, now we're ready to go to the bottom just to make sure we have good grounds everywhere and then uh, we can start to bring it up. Oh, I definitely see some audio mods in here. So this guy has been uh, gone over for AM. I'm not going to go um, explore the AM portion of this uh, too far at this point. I just want to get the transmitter basically working as a CW transmitter. I only have the 5U4 tube installed and I have a Variac on the AC line and I have the meter across the high voltage. All we're going to do is see if the transformer can produce high voltage. The tube should start to light and uh, suddenly we should get some emission. And we are. It's up above 100 volts already. We'll let those capacitors reform. Those are new caps, so it shouldn't be a big deal to get these caps to, to come up. Again, I think this is actually a working transmitter. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh-oh. Hearing sparking. Sparking is her being heard. That's never a good sign. So, always nice to be able to see what's going on when we have arcing and sparking. So, let's bring that voltage up again, slowly. Okay, meter is responding. Let's see if we can get some noise out of this thing, find out where the short is. Aha, found it. It's up in the switch in the front. Okay, so we're taking it down. It's up in this switch right here. Plug it. Okay, I soaked the switch in uh, some contact cleaner and I hit it with a Q-tip. I backed it out and tried to get in there as best I could and I put it back in. Didn't disconnect anything. And I have it on the first position. And let's see if it comes up in the first position. The off position. Nothing of course, but the first position. Let's try it. Okay, voltage is coming up. Okay, 14, 22. On this position of the switch at least, it looks like it's cleared. 645. 700 volts. Okay, that's full blast. 735 volts. 735 volts unloaded. Standby that seems to be the issue. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, there's the Arkenspark. So a fairly well-known issue, the uh, standby to tune, operate, once um, the uh, switch contacts become oxidized or uh, covered with, uh, with some carbon car or carbon tracks. There's very little you can do other than take the whole switch apart and see if you can either repair or replace the contacts. We definitely have a damaged contact and it's pitted to the point where the, uh, the contact is going to have to be replaced. Fortunately, it's the same size as most standard switches, and I'm going to try to uh, change it, change it out. It'll be a little tricky, but uh, hopefully we can change out the contact on the switch. Well, the question is, um, how did I fix the switch? Well, I replaced the contact. I took that off another switch, and it looks very similar to the other contacts. It's the same size. I found a little tiny Phillips head screw that fit through and put a nut and, and lock washer on the other side. So the, I, I'm very confident that the, the contact's going to be okay. Now the sliding part is a little more difficult. Um, I actually filled it with some silver solder and then very carefully uh, filed that off. And as you can see, I've kind of rebuilt the big pitted part of that contact. I don't know if you can see it, but the switch is quote-unquote rebuilt.
So if you do uh, have to work on the switch like I did and add a uh, add or replace uh, a contact that uh, has been damaged, if you have to uh, replace or repair a contact that's been damaged, make very sure if you take it off the uh, off the switch mechanism that you get it in the proper orientation and assembled back correctly. And uh, there's a pretty good picture in the manual that shows you the orientation it should look like when you are in the off position. And the off position is totally as far to the counterclockwise as possible. So it should look something like this and it will go in in this orientation. The switch has been repaired, hopefully. <laughs> and. Uh, the repair uh, involved replacing a contact uh, from another uh, donor switch and rebuilding the pitted area in the sliding contact and smoothing it out so there are no sharp edges with uh, silver solder. And then reattaching all of the wires carefully. But we're not ready to apply power yet. The next step is to actually buzz out everything we did make sure every single wire is connected to the switch properly. We knew that basically uh, we had no smoke so uh, we don't suspect any other parts of the uh, radio are going to give us trouble at this stage but uh, we have to make sure that all of those wires on that switch are correct. You know this is probably a good time to talk about that switch a little bit. Um, the mode switch or the function switch is uh, a known failure point in the DX40 and the DX35 and other uh, radios that have a standby operate tune type function in all in one switch and uh, they all will go bad it's just a matter of time and uh, a lot of people uh, have been uh, putting in relays so that that contact um, it has less strain on it and the, you're actually switching a relay. And I suppose a lot of these rigs have been modified for some type of a toggle switch arrangement where the switch takes the brunt of the punishment and it can be easily replaced just for that function. So a tune operate switch if you want. And that means drilling a hole through the front panel. This panel's already been damaged. Uh, it has two holes in it that would fit miniature uh, toggle switches as is. I just filled them with some screws. So you can see people thought nothing of drilling a hole in the front panel of these radios. Let's test the mode switch. We need to test the mode switch and uh, we'll use the Variac. Uh, we'll put it in uh, tune position and we're going to bring it up. What we're trying to do here is just see if we have any short circuits or problems. Okay, the voltage is coming up. Okay, there's the unloaded full blast. Take it back down again. Okay, next position is the problematic standby position. Okay, and we're bringing it up with the Variac and I'm bringing it up right now. Very little happening on the meter. There's 100%. Nothing happening. Okay, back down again with the Variac into the phone position. Bring the Variac back up again. 370 450 volts, 500, and all the way up. No issues. Okay, bring it back down again. CW position. Bring it back up. Okay, no issues. Okay, bring it down to 50%. Now, let's bring, turn it off. Let's bring it to 50%, and now we're going to do a switch test. Okay, tune. Stand by. Okay, 
it's, it's bleeding down. Okay. Phone. And CW. Very good. Now we go to full. Full output. Tune. Standby. Phone. CW. Phone. Standby. Tune. Off. The chances of making a mistake when you're doing work inside a, uh, a finished project like this one that someone else has wired um, and forgetting what you did, uh, it's always there. So what I like to do is when I'm working in a section like that function switch, I take a couple of pictures. I take a picture of it uh, in situ, you know, in place with all the wires attached. And then I take a picture uh, with the, the switch pulled out from the chassis and maybe a front shot. And if I'm really unsure, I'll actually print out those pictures and use them uh, to help me uh, to... Uh, put everything back the way it started. One design flaw in the DX40 is the lack of a fuse. I cannot believe that they built something like this without a fuse, especially with the uh, all the problems we hear about with the transformer. You have to wonder if a lot of that simply has to do with little short circuits that could have been uh, rectified by a simple uh, fuse in line. Who knows? That, uh, that mode switch alone could be uh, causing a a rather minor spark that could uh, cause a problem with the transformer. I like to use this small variac. It's really underrated. About 125 watt variac and it has a nice fuse and a three wire circuit and uh, you know if something's going to pop it's going to be the fuse in this variac before it uh, takes out the thing that you're testing. However I do have this big mama. This is a serious variac and uh, if we need to use that we can but uh, I usually reserve that for uh, larger uh, sets. So next we're going to do the accessory socket. Can you tell I did a little bit of Neverdoll work back here? We are looking at the accessory socket and we want to be in the tune position. Let's bring up the voltage the, uh, the voltage to the VFO is through a 15K dropping resistor. A 15K dropping resistor which is missing. It's been cut away. So the VFO couldn't get power. That's a bad thing. The resistor used to go between here and here. We need to get a resistor. Well, it doesn't have to be perfect. I've split the uh, the 15K into two resistors because uh, I didn't have a 15K, I had a 10K and a 5K and uh, just put them in series. Add a little terminal strip to hold. Also this is the time to check the rest of the connections on the accessory socket since we've already had one surprise there. Okay we've got the uh, we have got the uh, transmitter in the tune position we're in uh, pin 4 which is the B plus for the VFO and, uh, and ground and we're going to start bringing it up with the Variac. Again, only the 5U4 is installed, no other tubes. And remember, unloaded, you're going to get the full plate supply delivered to this socket. It's over 700 volts on that. It's only when the VF1 is connected and drawing current that you're actually going to see it go down to the requisite uh, 250 to 300 volts. It's a very primitive way of uh, supplying power. Okay, next we're going to check for filament voltage on pin 2. So we take this out and we put the meter into the AC volts position. And we go to pin 2, which is right here. 6.8 volts. This worries me, actually. When I see 6.8 volts 
on one of these old transmitters. That tells me that the primary is much higher than the design center. That should be 6.3 volts. That tells me that this was designed for more of a 110 volt system, not 120 or more that we have today. All of this puts stress on the transmitter. Okay, now we're checking the antenna relay. We need to see the 120 volts come up when we go into one of the transmit modes. There it is, 116.2 coming out. Okay, so now we're in the key jack, key VFO, and I've plugged the code key into the jack in front. Overload, zero. Overload, zero. Got another little story about high voltage. Uh, this is a, uh, a periodical by a man named Neville Williams in the Australian Electronics Magazine from February 1989. It's about one of the most important ham radio operators and engineers, Ross Hull. Ross Hull became a ham in Australia in the teens and early 20s. And uh, in 1923, he came over to see what it was all about here in America. He became uh, a very important engineer in the ARRL's uh, history and basically rewrote the entire handbook in 1928. He's responsible for fantastic prog progress in, uh, in ham radio and uh, improving signals dramatically. So here's some of the things that Ross Hall did. He popularized band spread for amateur receivers. Uh, he was responsible for the first serious use of the superheterodyne in amateur radio. Uh, produced the first practical apparatus employing high C circuits in Cole Pitts oscillators, for instance, the high C circuit of the VF1 would be attributed to him. He made the first presentations in amateur radio for the use of 100% modulation and the use of linear amplifiers. He introduced the concept of a signal monitor. Um, he encouraged the abandonment of the breadboard construction uh, towards the, uh, the bent metal chassis type construction that we have here. And it just in general, he, he stressed good workmanship in ham radio. Ham radio had been a wild land of uh, breadboards when he arrived and by the time he was done people were building proper circuits. However, even the best engineer on the planet and maybe we produce a Ross Hull every generation, an engineer of this level. He certainly was that in the late teens through the uh, through the 20s. He uh, on the evening of September 13th 1938 with the idea of showing a doctor friend the NBC TV transmissions, he slipped on a pair of headphones and reached under the bench to turn on the equipment. This is a homemade television equipment and he's going to show uh, TV in 1938. As he withdrew his hand, he touched the 4400 volt lead connecting to the rectifier top cap, dragging it with him as he fell. The doctor rushed to his aid, but his death had been instantaneous. So here we have the finest engineer produced in Australia at the time, and he slips up. The funny thing is, he was all about safety and protection and even had developed a system of light beams that once you break the beam, it would kill the high voltage. But he himself was not careful enough to save it. So we're getting closer to that part that I think everybody wanted to see, and that is uh, bringing the transmitter up. Um, they call for a 3500 and a 7 meg crystal. I mean, who has a 3500 and a 7 meg crystal? You know, I, I hear stories about, you know, oh, everything they tell you in the manual is wrong, you know, and so on. But uh, we're going we're gonna to try to uh, tune it up. I've uh, got the switch in the back set to the 80 meter rock. And uh, we're going to set the variac at 90 instead of 100, so hopefully it will uh, not explode too much. Okay, the manual says to uh, do the initial tuning in the phone position, which limits the current a little bit in the final. Let's get the grid set. Okay, there it is, around 2 milliamps. And look, we're getting a little bit of output already. Let's go to the plate. Ooh. Yeah, so about 35 watts out. So let's go back to phone. Next we're going to 
try 40 meters. Okay, let's go to uh, CW and plate, I'm sorry, phone and plate, and dip the final. There, we found resonance. Now we go to CW. And we try to bring it down. We go back to grid. Let's bring this up a little bit. Redip the plate. Bring it up a little more. Redip the plate. See how that works. Bring it up a little more. Redip the plate. And there we are at actually more power than we had on 80. Let's go back and check our grid. Bring it back up to 2. Back to plate. Dip it. Paying attention, you know that we had our variac set for 90%. So that was uh, probably around 100 volts. So now we are at the full line uh, level of, uh, you know, between 117 and 120 some odd volts. Let's see if that made any difference with the output. We'll go over here to the CW mode. And yes, uh, we're getting almost 45. But now. as you can hear, Nice note. Good crystal. Good transmitter. Well, the question is, uh, on 40 meters, with slightly high line voltage and plenty of grid drive, would you expect to be getting more than 45, actually, not quite 50, more than 45 watts out? Would you be expecting more? I think so. So I would guess, because we have plenty of grid drive, that the final is a little bit soft. So I hope you guys got something out of this video. It really isn't about mods. It's all about just repairing the set and getting it functional again. So Ross Hall, his call was 3JU. So in part two we're going to bring the uh, VF1 into the picture. We're going to uh, tune the rig up on some of the higher bands and explore the, uh, the grid drive we get up there. Uh, maybe try some different variants of the 6146 tubes and uh, finish it out with uh, an on-the-air contact with the DX40.